Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest event in the Chatham House Global Trade Policy Forum series. Uh, my name is Simon Fraser. I'm the deputy chair of Chatham House, and I will be chairing the discussion today. We're going to be looking today at US, EU, and UK trade, looking at the triangle, the bilateral trade relationships between the three, but also at the uh, sort of work of those three uh, trade players in the broader multilateral trade agenda. So it's quite a big agenda for us to be uh, addressing today. Uh, I want, before we start, to thank the uh, supporters of this program, so the founding partner, AIG, but also the supporting partners, Clifford Chance, Diageo, EY, and UPS. Today's event is on the record and will be recorded. We have three excellent uh, presenters to help kick us off and set the scene for our discussion. And I'm going to shortly invite each of them to talk to us for five minutes each from their different perspectives. From the United States, we have Marjorie Chorlins. From the EU side, Bernd Langer. And from the UK, Greg Hands, and I'll introduce them each a little bit in a little bit more detail before they speak. Uh, and when they have spoken, we will have a Q&A session and I will give you the instructions for how to intervene in that uh, a little later on. Just to set the scene from the chair, uh, I think this is a period of great change and rapid change in, in trade uh, for these three uh, players. We have a lot going on. Uh, and it's early days, really, in that change. We have, we're have approaching the 100 days of the new Biden administration in America. We have just passed the 100 days of effective Brexit uh, from the UK side, affecting the EU as well. There was other change happening uh, within the European Union, uh, political and otherwise. And of course, we've had change in the WTO with the appointment of the new uh, Director General of the WTO. So there's, there's much going on. I think there's a desire on all sides to strengthen the bilateral trade relationships between the US, the EU, and the UK, and there's a lot of work to do on that. Uh, and there's also, uh, I think, a new desire to work together and join up our activities on the broader trade agenda. But there are also uh, obstacles in the way. Of course, Brexit has created its own tensions in relation to Northern Ireland, as well as more broadly in um, UK EU trade. There are issues still around tariffs, uh, large aircraft subsidies across the Atlantic. There is the, the, the tensions around that COVID has generated in trade relations and broader political relations. And of course, China and other external factors which cut across the trade relations between the UK, the EU and the US. And on the wider agenda, we have a whole lot of things happening in the WTO, the agenda of WTO reform, the new trade agenda around technology, data, taxation, um, recent initiatives on that. And of course, the issues around climate and sustainability, which are affecting the trade agenda very much as well. So we are all facing a very interesting, challenging agenda uh, with many opportunities as well before us. And that is what I hope we're going to be able to unpack a bit in the next uh, hour uh, uh, with, uh, under the leadership of our three uh, panelists. So with no further uh, ado on my side, I'm going to first go to Marjorie and ask Marjorie to talk for five minutes about the US perspective. Marjorie has great experience on these issues. She is Senior Vice President for European Affairs at the US Chamber of Commerce. Uh, she has a lot of experience actually negotiating trade issues in the US government. Uh, she's worked both on the Hill and in the Department of Commerce. And she has experience from the industry side, working with Motorola and also with Lockheed Martin. So she's very well placed to give us the, the US perspective. Over to you, Marjorie. Simon, thanks very much. And um, uh, a big thank you to uh, friends at Chatham House for inviting me to join the conversation this morning. I uh, feel especially privileged to be sharing the virtual stage with uh, two gentlemen who are really at the center uh, of the policymaking uh, processes and decisions that will 
influence all of the issues that uh, that you just talked about, Simon. Um, indeed, I would argue that that you've you've pretty much taken my five minutes. So uh, let me just touch on a on a couple of points first. Um, I, I want to say at the outset, I want to um, share my uh, sort of absolute profound relief uh, at the implosion of the European Super League. Uh, and uh, uh, say that I believe that there are some things that are just better left unchallenged. Um, but having said that, there are also a lot of changes that are happening uh, in our world today. And I think those create uh, significant opportunities uh, as well as challenges. Look, we're talking in part about the individual bilateral relationships, but this is also framed as uh, a conversation about the triangle among the three economies. And my view is that there are certain sort of immutable facts about each facet of that triangle. Uh, and, and they are simply that they must be strong. Uh, the, the strength of each of these legs of the triangle has a direct and profound impact on our ability uh, to, to tackle some of the greatest challenges we face collectively today. Um, there are challenges and opportunities inherent in each facet uh, of the triangle and um, also for each facet it's complicated uh, by politics and, and other decisions. So Simon talked uh, about the, the changes that are happening in each of our countries, the 100 day uh, benchmark in the US, uh, in, in the UK and EU. Um, we've also seen sort of profound shifts in the political landscape in our respective um, economies. And um, of course, the, 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 the devastating impacts of COVID have uh, directly challenged many of the, the, the sort of fundamental, uh, um, the sort of fundamental assumptions we have all made uh, about it, the international economy and the international trading system. Uh, so I, I would say we are at indeed um, at, at something of an inflection point. Uh, and those changes that, that Simon talked about um, and how we respond to those changes and how we rise uh, to, to the challenges that we're confronted with, I think um, uh, will not only impact our respective strength, but our collective leadership um, in tackling, frankly, uh, uh, setting the rules, the new rules of the road uh, for an evolving international trading system um, and also ensuring that there is the, the promotion um, and the, the taking hold of the fundamental Western values of free enterprise, democracy, uh, human rights and rule of law. Just briefly about the changes in the US, obviously a significant since uh, the, the beginning of January. I won't speak to the, uh, the, the events of January 6th, but there is no question uh, that, that that is emblematic of sort of a fundamental challenge we have in this country, <clears throat> which is a, a stark political divide uh, where uh, the different facets of the political spectrum uh, are having, especially the, the ends of the political spectrum, are having more and more influence on the policy making decisions. We have an administration that has come in and said very clearly that their focus is on, uh, on three issues, all centered around uh, a rebuilding and rebirth of the, uh, of the American economy, and that is uh, COVID climate and China. Every aspect of uh, US policy ostensibly is being run through the lens of <clears throat> how do we reshape or, or hone, I suppose, the system in the US or systems in the US to take account of um, the domestic needs, but also enveloped by these global challenges. I would argue that, that we do have opportunities on all of these three C's, obviously three C's here meaning a little bit different than what it means in Europe, uh, but three C's and a D, I guess I would say, which we can talk about briefly. But before I get to that, let me just say 
a prerequisite to our ability to collaborate on, on any of these issues is to resolve uh, the outstanding disputes that linger uh, uh, between us. Obviously, Simon mentioned uh, the large civil aircraft subsidy dispute. We also have the Section 232 uh, uh, measures on imports of steel and aluminum from the EU and the UK and the associated countermeasures. Uh, we have an absolutely urgent need uh, to, uh, to, to finalize a successor to Privacy Shield uh, to allow for the free flow of data between the US and Europe. Frankly, I'm not sure there is as much urgency, a sense of urgency in Europe uh, as there is in the US, but I, I promise you that uh, businesses on both sides of the Atlantic find this um, uh, a top priority. Uh, and obviously between the UK and the EU, um, it's not a it's not a one-off fix. It's a it's a, a, a refashioning of the relationship on the basis of, of the TCA and, and the new rules of the road that you'll be um, that you'll be working through. In each of the three C's, climate, climate, COVID, and China, we have opportunities to work together. I'm not going to walk through where I see those opportunities, but suffice it to say that it, I do believe it is imperative for us to seize those opportunities. It is also imperative, as I said, for us to seize the opportunity to refashion the international rules of the road when it comes to trade, to address many of the challenges that have arisen, um, and frankly, as a result of, of all of those developments. Um, but I also think we cannot underestimate how real the challenges are with each of these, um, with each of these issues as well. Uh, we each face uh, pressures domestically uh, that will fundamentally influence how we address these issues. And, um, and I think there are certain expectations and circumstances that, that each of us has, has sort of top of mind that influences our ability to work effectively together. And here we can certainly talk about more, more about things like uh, uh, sort of the, uh, the impact on supply chains uh, that we've seen as an outgrowth of the, uh, the COVID issue. Um, and on the digital side, Europe's drive for te technological sovereignty and the emergence of, uh, of advanced technologies and so on. Bottom line, we have work to do. It's imperative that we do the work. There are great opportunities if we work together and we can't be naive about the challenges. Thank you very much, Marjorie, for, for setting that out. And uh, you described very clearly uh, a big agenda, lots of opportunities, but as you say, lots of challenges. And the, thank you very much for identifying the three C's, which is a helpful way of sort of calibrating the big agenda for the, for the new uh, administration. Let me, let me turn now to the EU side, if I may, to, to Bernd. Uh, Bernd is uh, a German MEP representing the uh, SPD. Uh, uh, he has long experience in uh, European politics in the European Parliament, uh, and notably working on trade-related issues. And he was chair of the Committee on International Trade and rapporteur on EU-US trade relations, amongst other things. Uh, and he has a long uh, political background in Germany, in the Trade Union Confederation, and in German politics. So, Bernd, over to you to give us a perspective from, I hope, from Brussels and from Berlin, perhaps. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm here in Brussels, so um, I will give the, the perspective from the European Parliament. and. As you mentioned quite rightly, I'm the standing rapporteur for the relation with the United States, but uh, I'm also a member of the UK-EU coordination group inside the European Parliament. And so I have to tackle with uh, both uh, partners we are talking today. And um, we have some uh, irritations on the table, indeed, with both partners. And Maria mentioned some of them, the Airbus Boeing case with the United States, the, Three to uh, uh, two, three, uh, two steel tariffs, and there is an escalation in the air because in our countermeasure uh, legislation, we announced uh, that if there is no solution found until the 1st of June, then we will double our countermeasures. Uh, and this is a uh, hard stuff. Uh, I had a discussion with Harley Davidson, for example. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, so we have to try to de-escalate. But I think at the moment, the doors are open. We have a new government um, and um, a new perspective on uh, different items. 
And we have also some irritations with the uh, United Kingdom on uh, specifically the protocol on Northern Ireland and some unilateral measures, uh, which in our understanding are not in line with uh, the agreement. So we have to discuss this uh, together as well. But nevertheless, uh, even we have some irritation on both sides. There are also some signs of hope. As I mentioned, in the United States, we have a new government. We have the lift of the tariffs on Airbus Boeing conflict for four months, and we can now try to find a solution, which is important for both of us, not, uh, but of course also to third parties, uh, which are now coming up with the production of aircrafts as well. And on the UK, even we have this uh, uh, controversial discussion, we are able to find, for example, compromises in the TRQ at uh, WTO, uh, dividing the tariff quotas between the European Union and the United Kingdom without any problems. So there are possibilities. And based on that, I can announce uh, that the European Parliament has decided two hours ago that we will ratify the uh, trade and partnership agreement next week in the European Parliament. And therefore, we we'll have then also a profound ground for the um, future of our relations. And I think in the triangle, we have a good chance uh, to build on a um, yeah, multilateral way, because the key question for today in the field of trade is, go with the direction, the path of multilateral rules, or we stick to unilateral measures. And I think now the window of opportunity for multilateral rules-based trade is a little bit more open than one year ago. And uh, in our case, I see, see four items where we can really work together. First, on standard setting, uh, the question of data flows. Uh, in a broader sense, the regulation for innovative technology is important. For example, artificial intelligence. So there is a proposal by the Commission uh, from yesterday, but uh, there are a lot of open questions, and we should really discuss uh, among us because we have similar interests on the three of us and. Uh, also similar values and therefore we should really try to find standards, global standards for the future, specifically in innovative technology. Secondly, the WTO reform, I think we have also some common interest on modernization of the rule book, besides the appellate bodies, this is not another story, but on the question of uh, Digital trade, so e-commerce, I think it's a priority for all of us and we should and could work together. And on uh, the trade and health initiative by the Ottawa Group, uh, this is, I think, also common interest. It should be go for a result at the MC12 uh, at the end of this year. Thirdly, China. Uh, I think we have a common interest in getting China back to a rule-based system on intellectual pottery rights and specifically regarding uh, state aid uh, and uh, uh, public procurement. And there, I think we can really find common uh, solutions and common steps in this direction. And fourthly, the question of the transformation, the Green Deal. There will be a new climate target quite soon in the United States. Uh, UK has a quite ambitious uh, climate uh, target and the European Union since uh, yesterday, also a target for 2030 with a reduction of 55%. So the transformation of our industry, uh, which is a, a, a challenging uh, 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 exercise, I think uh, might be also lead to some common approach also perhaps in the discussion, which measures uh, could really uh, support this transformation to the Green Deal in the global field as well. So there is a room for cooperation in the future. Point. 
Thank you very much. Very clear, um, uh, very focused in terms of uh, your agenda. And I think there'll be a lot that people will want to pick up on that, Ben. So thank you for that intervention. And I'll turn now to uh, Greg, Greg Hands, uh, to speak from the UK perspective. Greg um, is the Minister of State for Trade Policy in the Department for International Trade. Uh, and uh, has been involved in trade policy matters, trade matters for some time in this government. Uh, he uh, has previously served in other ministerial positions, including as Chief Secretary to the Treasury. So he's well versed in the broader aspects of British economic as well as trade policy. Obviously, the UK is in the throes of launching its independent trade uh, policies now, as well as managing Brexit. So. Greg, if I could uh, ask you to give us the view from, from London, that would be very welcome. Uh, well, thank you, Simon, and uh, great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And one thing I'm not going to give you a view on is the European Super League, um, not least as I'm Member of Parliament uh, for Chelsea and Fulham. I, I'm a unique in representing two Premiership football clubs and the thought of them being divided and not being able to play each other uh, with the local uh, derby that I have each year in my constituency uh, was quite distressing uh, to me uh, and to uh, a lot of the fans. So I'm particularly glad that um, the European Super League uh, never actually played. Um, but anyway, I expect that debate will continue uh, um, in the future. But a great pleasure to be with you um, today. Um, I think um, the inception, um, I don't want to look too far backwards, but uh, the UK's Department for International Trade uh, was set up um, straight after the referendum, uh, recognizing that whatever the course of, then I'll return to the UK-EU trade relationship in a moment, uh, but whatever the course would be that the UK uh, would now have an independent trade policy. Uh, and now it's a question of how we make best use of that independent trade policy really uh, for the first time since um, the 1st of January, 1973. Uh, when I was seven years old. So I, I couldn't even find at the inception of the department uh, anybody who had any experience of the UK having previously had its independent trade policy. But we've done a huge amount in the last um, four and a half years. I would say, where does the UK fit in? Uh, first of all, we will be an unashamed, uh, strong voice uh, for global free trade and the global rules-based system. Now, uh, I think all of us believe in that. Uh, I I think the UK, uh, I would like to think that we will be at least as strong a supporter uh, of that system uh, as the United States or the European Union. I think the UK will be absolutely out there uh, on the front foot, which is what we've shown uh, so far at the WTO, which I'll also return to uh, in a moment. Um, I wouldn't view it really as a triangle. I think uh, Marjorie and Bernd uh, and I, um, our content would be really remarkably similar. I think our worldviews would be reasonably similar. You know, I think these are areas broadly we can, you know, inevitably in these kind of things, people will highlight the differences. Uh, but I think actually the strong commonality of views, uh, a belief in uh, free trade, a belief in the rules based system, uh, a belief in uh, global prosperity and a belief in our Western values. Um, I think in terms of looking at the bilateral situation, um, we're delighted to have done the trading cooperation agreement with the European Union, delighted that uh, it's going to be ratified uh, by the European Parliament. And thank you, Bernd, and everything that your uh, MEP colleagues have done. I think you must sit with David McAllister, my good friend from the opposite party to you in Germany. I should say, by the way, I've, I, I'm a joint US-UK citizen and spent a large part of my life living in Germany. So I feel as if I'm sometimes kind of live the trilateral myself, or at least as far as the German uh, aspect of it is concerned. But look, I think on the TCA, we saw a, um, a fall in um, UK-EU trade in January. Um, it's very tough to take a month-by-month -month trade data. I think as most people on this call will know, there's been a significant bounce back in February. Uh, I think it's fair to say there are still uh, frictions in that relationship. Uh, it's definitely too, far, far too early to say that uh, um, just because the bounce back in February that uh, problems have been fixed. Uh, I think there is uh, still uh, engagement to be done uh, by governments, uh, both in London, in Brussels, uh, and also amongst uh, the EU member states. Um, but I think overall, you know, never forget the UK has overnight become the EU's second largest external trade partner, only just behind the United States. So, you know, we are a significant uh, market for the EU in its own right. 
turning to our bilateral relationship with the United States, uh, I think that is in a very good position. Uh, we've done um, four significant rounds of talks uh, with the previous US trade representative towards a UK-US uh, free trade agreement. Uh, we welcome um, the new administration, uh, particularly its commitment to, uh, and rejoining the Paris Accord. Uh, we welcome the appointment of Catherine Tai and Secretary of State Liz Truss has already had an introductory call uh, with Catherine Tai, as is indeed Commissioner um, Dombrovskis uh, as well. And we think we're in a good position there. Uh, we think it's perfectly possible to do a good deal with both. You know, Canada has shown that you can uh, do a comprehensive free trade agreement with both um, the European Union and uh, with the United States. We don't think the UK uh, could or should be uh, any different. Uh, obviously, there will still be issues there. It's ultimately a negotiation. It's a live negotiation. Uh, so I can't comment uh, more on that, but we are looking forward to progressing uh, our talks um, with the, uh, the US. I think in terms of where else are we working, we're chairs of the G7 uh, this year, um, and there's a very significant trade track, I think for the first time at the G7. Uh, we've already engaged with the new WTO Director General, Dr. Ngozi, on this. Uh, and we are looking forward to moving forward uh, WTO reform, which I'm sure uh, we'll return to. Um, a couple of the other trade frictions that are out there, um, uh, the Section 232 tariffs um, with the US, um, just to be absolutely clear that we think these are uh, entirely unwarranted. Um, the steel dispute uh, should not be between the US and the UK, or indeed with the EU actually for that matter, uh, but should be very much focused on China. Uh, we're not a national security threat to, to the United States uh, when it comes to steel. In fact, a large amount of the UK steel exported to the US uh, goes into the US defense system. So I would actually argue we're, we're not a national security threat. We're here to help national security. Um, I think on the EU, and I, 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 the only thing I would urge on the EU side is, is just to, um, against any uh, export ban on vaccines. I think that's really, really important to put on the table as well. I think that would be a, a very uh, unhelpful uh, move forward. But fortunately, I think the talks there and the uh, where we are there, I think working together on vaccines, and that applies very much between ourselves and the United States as well, I think has got to be the way forward. Uh, um, a, a vaccine dispute will only result in fewer people being vaccinated ultimately, uh, which doesn't do anybody any good. So very briefly, Simon, climate at COP26, a big part of the UK's agenda um, this year. Uh, you'll have seen uh, our own uh, big initiatives on, uh, uh, on, on climate announced uh, this week. Digital and e-commerce uh, moving forward there. Uh, particularly the JSI at the WTO, uh, making sure that that uh, moves forward. Um, um, services trade, really important for the UK and the US and, and for the EU. 80% of the UK economy is in services. And finally, just to end where we started, really, working with allies. That inevitably there might be focus on, on nuances and divides uh, in, this, in this trilateral, but ultimately, uh, I refer back to um, President Biden's uh, first foreign policy interview at the end of last year in the New York Times, when he talked about his trade policy being based on building alliances uh, and dealing with the problem as he sees it, uh, which I think many of us does see it with uh, particular reference to uh, China and unfair trade practices uh, and so on. That should really be where uh, we should be working together, I think. Uh, and that's where I'm hoping um, to um, 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 continue the conversation here today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, uh, thank you to all our three uh, presenters, because you've really put a lot of issues on the table uh, and it's a very big agenda. And actually, at the end, uh, I mean, Greg, you highlighted one thing which has always been very dear to my own heart, which is that trade policy is very much uh, integral to wider foreign policy and, uh, and strategy. And in, in the current geopolitical moment, that is um, possibly more true than ever. So um, while we look at the narrow issues, we always, always have to keep the broader picture in mind. Can I now invite everybody, please, if you want to raise a uh, uh, to ask a question, please do use the raised hand function and uh, we'll see your hand raised and then we will come to you and you will be invited to put your questions directly to our participants. So please don't hang back, don't feel shy. We've got a good half hour now to go into the depth of these of these issues. Whilst you're all raising your hands, I'm going to, uh, 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 as chair, as so often, ask the first question. And actually, I'm going to pick up on on where Greg left us, which is 
with this question, if I can, I'm going to go to Marjorie, back to Marjorie, and, and talk a little about U.S. leadership. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we do know that the United States, uh, under its new administration, uh, is interested in bringing allies together, in, in getting the like-minded democratic countries <laughs> back uh, into a more collaborative posture together. Uh, but we also know at the same time that it's an, it's an administration with a very heavy domestic focus and an urgent domestic agenda. We're continually being told that that is the priority. Uh, and we understand why that should be the case. And at the same time, you have a legacy in the United States of some skepticism towards the multilateral system and the WTO in particular. So my question, Marjorie, is will there be both the energy and capacity, but also the, 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 the will um, to, for the United States to actually give that leadership in the broader multilateral trade context for the rest of us to align with you on? Well, Simon, I think you, you've put your finger on the, the, the fundamental question that we all have. Look, there's no doubt that the administration made very clear, uh, even as a candidate, as you say, and, and then certainly at the beginning of the administration, um, <clears throat> the intention to focus heavily on rebuilding alliances. Um, uh, obviously, some of the earliest calls that the president and secretary of state made were to European allies uh, and a clear indication that they want to make good uh, on that promise. Likewise, the return to Paris, uh, the return to the WHO, and so on, a clear demonstration of the administration's commitment uh, to, to the multilateral order. I do think, frankly, that the focus on the domestic agenda, while it is very real here, uh, indeed, we talk about, uh, this administration talks about a foreign policy for the middle class, and we're all trying to figure out exactly what that means. I would argue that the focus on the domestic agenda is one that, that we all share, um, in part because all the things that we're talking about, COVID, climate, China, um, and the digital revolution, are having a fundamental impact on our respective uh, economies and societies. So, so the focus on domestic isn't necessarily surprising to me. Uh, what I do think is an open question is how the administration will translate um, that, that focus on the domestic agenda and that commitment to the international system in a way that actually allows for the U.S. to demonstrate leadership um, uh, and allows us to, to sort of break new ground uh, together with, with our allies. You know, look, the, the administration has been, just look at the individual relationships. The U.S. has, has indicated very clearly its interest in wanting to negotiate a U.S.-U.K. FTA. Um, there obviously are questions about the, implement, the implementation of the TCA and the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, but the, the, the interest is there. Now, will Catherine Tai come back to the table anytime soon? That's an open question. Um, ditto with Europe, uh, ditto with WTO reform. I would argue when you look at WTO reform, uh, not only do we need to re revivify uh, the multilateral system, we need to think about plurilateral opportunities. We need to resolve uh, some of the outstanding negotiations uh, like uh, on e-commerce or the fisheries agreement that's been going on for so long. And, and I think we also um, do have to deal with the dispute settlement uh, infrastructure. Do I think there is a, a political will in the US to do this? I do. Um, I, I do think that there, I mean, the, the polls show, frankly, that there's been an increase in support for international trade in the United States uh, in recent years, and, and that has not dissipated. Um, there's been an evolution uh, between the political parties of where that support lies. Uh, but the practical reality is, I think there's a recognition that it's important for us uh, to, to engage internationally. And I think we will see, um, we will see how that actually plays out. Um, I do think that there will be an emphasis on, on doing things together. It won't take away the, the tendency to want to um, retain, you know, unilateral tools. It's the same for, for all of us. I think that the resolution of the LCA dispute is, is actually more, more likely sooner uh, than, than the lifting of the 232 tariffs. I think that is that sort of encapsulates that intersection between the domestic and the international. Uh, and, and I think that it's going to be a challenge, but I do think it's possible. So 
I, I am I am optimistic but realistic. Okay, thank you very much. We'll, I'm, I'm sure that people will test that further. Um, now we have got some questions that are that are coming in, so I'll, I'll I think I'll go to the participants and open up the floor so that we get maximum opportunity for debate. The first person uh, who asked is Adam Isaacs. If you could ask your question, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question for the minister. Minister, it's lovely to have you here with us. Um, in 2018, the Trump administration downgraded the diplomatic status of the EU delegation in Washington. And the UK joined the other 27 member states then in protesting about this, arguing that the EU, EU should be accorded full diplomatic status. And um, in a couple of months, the Trump administration backed down. It'd be very useful to understand why the UK government refuses to accord the, U, uh, the EU full status, uniquely out of the 143 missions the EU has. What does the UK think that it will achieve by doing so? How does this square with the longer term objectives where trade policy is just one of these activities? And will the um, head of the EU office in London get a comfortable chair in the Locarno room or be forced to sit in an uncomfortable chair for nine hours opposite the minister? Thank you. Uh, well, 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 thank you for that, Adam. And you're tempting me down a road um, which is uh, quite uh, far outside of my um, um, trade policy brief. Uh, and you're making, a, we say, a cunning reference to some speculation uh, in yesterday's uh, Daily Telegraph in relation to the furniture in the Locarno room and the uh, and the visit uh, taking place right now of the uh, Australian um, trade minister. Look, I'm not going to. It's. It, I think that's a question better put to a, an FCDO minister. But look, it's my business um, to, in all these things, to sort of calm down the rhetoric. You know, trade um, needs good political relations. Uh, trade needs good political relations to flow, and it needs a good political understanding. I, I'm in the process at the moment of uh, speaking to all of my um, EU opposite trade uh, minister, opposite numbers of, amongst EU trade ministers. Um, setting up uh, where uh, necessary, where appropriate, uh, bilateral uh, trade dialogues. Um, so along with the work that Lord Frost is doing uh, with Brussels, uh, from a trade perspective, you know, we are making sure, I sat for two years on uh, EU trade facts, so I know quite a few of my uh, EU opposite numbers, and, and we're in the business of, of building uh, um, good relations there, uh, and making sure that we do everything that we can to um, um, keep trade flowing and make sure that the new agreement uh, works well, uh, works well for businesses. Um, there'll be some obstacles that we might not be able to come, but many obstacles we ought to be able to overcome. Uh, some obstacles would be based on uh, differential uh, treatment of the rules that are there by different member states. Uh, some rules will be, some obstacles will be based on uh, areas which are in member state competence. So, you know, we're in the business of of removing and reducing obstacles, uh, particularly when it uh, comes to trade. But I think um, your question is probably better put to, a, uh, to an FCDO minister. Thank you. But if I could just follow up briefly on that, Greg, I mean, I, they have the reports in the British media recently have been that there is a concerted effort by the UK government to try to defuse a bit of the tension in the relation with the EU and the Prime Minister is talking about sandpapering uh, the rough bits away. I mean, could you just say something about, very, very briefly, about, about the, the, the atmospherics? Well, I think, you know, inevitably, look, I mean, uh, I'm a living, breathing person for this relationship. You know, my wife is German. I've got bilingual kids who are uh, um, UK, um, uh, EU nationals. And, and, you know, the UK leaving the European Union. Uh, was not going to be, uh, um, uh, ever going to be um, a, a smooth and easy process uh, without any uh, lasting impact. Let's, let's be absolutely frank about it. Um, but I think it's strongly in both sides' interest to make the relationship work really well. Going back to where I started, uh, our commonalities and shared common interests um, is huge across, uh, way beyond trade, but across uh, um, security, uh, counterterrorism, defense, uh, the global rules-based system, our stances in relation to Russia, China, Iran, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we need to make the relationship work. Um, I think the meeting between uh, Lord Frost and uh, Maros Shevtovich uh, last week, I think, went very well indeed uh, in helping improve um, the working relations in relation to the protocol 
uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, that situation seems to be improving. A lot of these will just need time and a lot of effort. You know, we cannot uh, uh, sit by. You know, we need to engage, which is exactly what DIT is doing uh, with our trade relations with each of those uh, EU 27 member states, as well as the work uh, Lord Frost is doing with Brussels. So, uh, look, I think there'll be, um, you know, there'll be further bumps in the road, uh, I expect. I mean, I couldn't predict exactly what they'll be, but uh, as I say, the process here um, will inevitably give rise uh, to bumps. Um, but um, overall, I think we're working well together and we need to uh, uh, make sure that that is a good trusting relationship. Okay, thanks. Um, Let's go to, the, I'm going to take two questions now, if I can, in the interest of time, uh, and then uh, uh, put them to the panel. So first of all, uh, Jan Adrea, and then uh, Charles, uh, uh, the second one, I think is, uh, uh, sorry, hold on one second. The second person is, uh, yes, Charles Bralba. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for, for having me um, on board. Um, I have... Two questions in, in, in one, um, to, one to all panelists, more or less. What, do, do you see the chance uh, of, of something trilateral really emerging in the, let's say, in the coming year or two in terms of the UK, the EU and the US uh, resolving their differences uh, on, on 232 and um, Airbus, but also really driving a common agenda? Uh, I mean, everything. I have the feeling that everything is still very bilateral. Uh, what would be the conditions for something trilateral actually to emerge? And then I have a question uh, to the minister and maybe also to Bernd Lange is what, how much note comparing is there already uh, in terms of resolving the Airbus um, uh, subsidies case? Because this is obviously joint legacy and uh, common interest here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. And I think Charles may not. Is Charles, are you still on the call? If not, um, can I just? I'll just throw Charles's question in, and then I'll go to the three panelists because Jana's questions cover a lot of a lot of uh, of ground. But the other question was, what is the most likely area of lingering disagreement between the EU and US uh, in relation to trade with China, which I think is very is linked to the question of where are areas for trilateral cooperation. So uh, maybe we can uh, join that in. I'll go first to Bernd because uh, the other two panelists have spoken recently. Could you look at, could you address the two questions that uh, Jana put forward? And then I'll go to the others. Yeah, but of course, allow me that I uh, would like to make some comments on the question of leadership and on, on trust. Huh? So it's totally clear that the European Union has a vision that uh, we are uh, uh, dealing with partners and not with a leader and a uh, 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 country which is following the leader. So we are quite self-confident that the strategic open autonomy from the European Union is guarantee uh, the, uh, um, uh, 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 the respect of uh, the political and economic interests. And, Built on this, we are able to have a partnership with the United States, with the United Kingdom, no doubt about. And uh, Mr. Greg, um, the question of trust, of course, is uh, an important question. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, the conflicts uh, on the protocol of Ireland are solved quite soon. And uh, uh, during the negotiations on uh, the ratification of the TCA, um, my colleagues mentioned this mistrust as one of the major uh, obstacles. And so I think we need really some clear examples for rebuilding uh, uh, trust. Um, and um, on the question of, you mentioned in your introduction on the export ban of vaccine, I think that's also not um, uh, uh, in line with reality. Yeah? Look, the European Union is the only region worldwide, which is exporting in a huge volume vaccine. Until now, until yesterday, the European Union exported 136 million of doses of vaccine to 43 countries worldwide. This is not similar to the export structure of vaccine in the United Kingdom, neither in 
the uh, uh, USA. Uh, and this is also the question, uh, what's about leadership? Huh? So I think everybody has the responsibility to deal uh, along their values. And this is clear the message uh, of the European Union. And on this basis, I think we should really try to find common um, possibilities and common approach in several elements. And I mentioned some of them at the beginning. I think, yeah, there are possibilities and even some urgent uh, sees. So the question of the regulation for the digital world is really urgent. So the artificial intelligence should be on the top of the priorities of a common work to set global standards for that in the interest of the people. And I like very much the, uh, uh, speak, the speech of um, Catherine Fry recently saying uh, workers and wages are in the middle of the trade policy of the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the people first is the right approach for that. So there is uh, uh, some urgent need and there are some possibilities. And regarding China, yeah, of course, we have uh, the, both sides of the coin. On the one side, it's important to cooperate with China. I think it's uh, also the case with the United States, and no doubt about uh, some economic interests. Uh, the phase one agreement is there, and uh, the trade relations are really increasing. Uh, and we need China in the field of the global cooperation, the WTO and other international organizations as well. But on the other side, we have some geostrategic interests of China, which are not in line with our values and our understanding of a rule-based uh, trading uh, system and uh, political system as well. And there we have common interests that we should really base on that in our common um, uh, strategy. So the question of intellectual property rights is really clearly the question of subsidies, uh, the, the question of access to public uh, procurement, the question, of course, of forced labor are uh, elements uh, where we can work together and on the other side of uh, the coin uh, named China. So isolation is not the proper way. And I think this is not in the interest of the uh, three uh, parties uh, represented here. Thank you. Marjorie and Greg, I don't know if you want to come in on these questions. And in particular, I think yeah, I also raised the question of Boeing Airbus and progress on that issue. So, Marjorie, do you want to? Sure. Yeah. So um, many, many thoughts, but I'll try to keep them brief. <laughs> <laughs> Look, as I said on Boeing Airbus, I do think I know for a fact that this is uh, an issue that the administration is very focused on. We know that the last administration was also focused on trying to find a resolution, but they did not. Um, but I do think there's a real opportunity here uh, because there is a recognition that we've sort of run the clock as far as the, uh, the, the dispute processes go and it's time uh, to, to find a resolution. And I, I'd like to think that we can. Um, on the question of, um, uh, of, of China, I think Bernd laid out very clearly um, that we do have, uh, there are a number of areas where there is opportunity for common ground. Um, I, I, you know, I would add to that list the opportunity to sort of <clears throat> ensure that we have complementary strategies when it comes to investment screening, uh, when it comes to competition and export controls, uh, when it comes to data uh, and, and standard setting indeed, as Bernd said. I think the question for me when it comes to China is um, to what extent is Europe really of one mind uh, about China? And it strikes me that there, there is a, a challenge there. Now, we know there's a European policy that says um, China is at once a, a, a commercial partner, a strategic competitor, and a systemic rival. That's kind of a neat, sounds like a neat way to put it, but the practical reality is I'm not sure every member state has the same sense of how those different facets of the relationship uh, uh, pan out. And, uh, and so I think that our ability to collaborate is, um, is somewhat, uh, may be constrained there. Now that's why we think it's important for the US and Europe to, uh, to set up a trade and technology council. 
because I do think this is an opportunity for us to, to talk about not only setting common rules of the road for advanced technologies, um, but, but also how can we take some of these policies and find ways to coordinate. I would argue uh, that we need to have a similar dialogue with the UK. Um, you know, in terms of can the three of us, um, uh, can the three of us, should we be, you know, all working together? I would say, yes, there are opportunities for us to work together in every instance. But I also think it's imperative uh, on, on each of us to, to make sure we're clear eyed about what our respective policies are and honest about where those opportunities are to, uh, to collaborate. I think, you know, obviously the UK is at the front end of sorting out uh, some of these issues as well in its own mind, having that flexibility to do so. Uh, so I'd like to think that we can do these things together, um, but I do think we have to get through some of the, some of the basics first. Last one I would make is about technology and strategic autonomy and te technological sovereignty on the other hand. Here again, um, absolutely recognize and respect Europe's desire, frankly, the US desire, the UK desire uh, to make sure uh, that we are on strong competitive footing internationally. The question is uh, how you go about doing that. And if to create, inter create space for um, your own domestic industry to, to sort of rise up, understand that impulse. But the question is, do you do that at the expense of, uh, of other countries and the ability to trade um, um, openly and fairly? So, so that's where I think we see some potential tension. Um, but again, we're at the front end of playing a lot of this out. OK, um, I'd like to take some more, some more questions, but I don't know, Greg, if you want to just chip in on, on those ones. Real quick, Simon, um, just to say on, yeah. on, on, on China working together, absolutely. Um, the UK has taken a very significant measures back in January uh, in terms of supply chains linked to Xinjiang and also actions, uh, uh, Magnitsky style actions uh, on, on particular Chinese officials. We're definitely uh, 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 in, that, uh, in that area for tougher action. Um, I think generally more cooperation between um, the, the UK, the EU, the US and, and other like-minded partners in all of these areas. Um, the UK this year with our G7 chairing and also just as we're talking at the moment, the, um, the climate uh, um, um, short uh, climate uh, conference convened by the president today uh, that our prime minister was addressing just an hour ago, the leaders climate summit. Um, I think also shows how we can work together on those key issues. So I'm definitely, we are in the UK, we're definitely up for more cooperation uh, on all of these issues. Okay, thank you very much. Now we've got about six minutes left. So what I'm going to try and do is, is take a, a couple more questions, if I may, and then uh, put them to, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through everybody on the list, and I apologize for that, but uh, so two more questions, and then we'll go back to the participants. That will probably uh, fill it up. So um, first of all, Garvin Brown, and then uh, Marianne Bitzinger, please. Uh, it's uh, Garvin Brown. I'm the chairman of Brown Foreman Corporation. Uh, my family's company, we're the distiller of Jack Daniels Tennessee whiskey. I'm a uh, resident, actually, in the United Kingdom, um, just north of your constituency, um, Mr. Mr. Hans. Um, and my, my question is for uh, Herr Lange, first off. Um, uh, will the European Union double their 232 uh, related retaliatory tariff against American whiskey uh, in June of this year, as is the current default position in Brussels? And my question for Mr. Hans is whether or not the United Kingdom would follow suit with such a doubling. Um, if it didn't, um, better yet, why has the United Kingdom not yet gotten rid of the Jack Daniels tax since having left the EU, uh, why hasn't the United Kingdom taken back control on this particular issue and champion trade with America? And finally, uh, for the Chamber of Commerce, have you had any luck in convincing uh, the United States government, uh, in particular the Under Secretary, who recently came out in favor of the steel and aluminum tariffs uh, that in fact um, putting Canada, the United Kingdom, and the EU in the same bucket as China on something like steel and aluminum uh, is not remotely in the geopolitical interest of the United States. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Garvin. No, a man with some interests at stake here. Uh, Marianne? 
Hi, I'm Marianne Petzinger, Senior Research Fellow with the SN Americas program here at Chatham House. Um, my question is on trade and climate, because it seems to me that all panelists um, agree that this is an area of increased cooperation, and I certainly share that view, but is there also perhaps an um, opportunity there where there's transatlantic tensions that could arise, for example, over very different perspectives and approaches to a carbon border adjustment mechanism? And how could those potential tensions best be managed? Okay, thank you very much, Marianne. I'm going to throw one more question into the pot, and that is from Stephen Cooney. Go yes, ahead. Uh, well, just I'll, I'll, I'll pass to the gentleman who asked the question on steel. That's what I'm interested in. Uh, and, okay. And there, there are two sets of steel tariffs, just very quickly. There are the Trump era tariffs, uh, and then there is the earlier historic tariffs uh, dating back to the Davignon plant. Okay. Right. Well, look, so to, to the panelists, um, uh, if you could pick those up. So we've got the issues around tariffs, which are obviously top of mind. And then we've got the broader issues around climate and uh, the carbon uh, uh, related question. Um, I'm going to if I'm going to go to you each in sequence and if you could just pick those up, which bits you want to and any final comments in the next three minutes, I'll I'll go in reverse order. So I'll start with Greg. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Just on, uh, thank you for Brian Foreman. I think, Garvin, you and I have met, uh, or certainly met other representatives of Brian Foreman. And, and look, I, I, for us, it's relatively straightforward. Um, if the US list lifted the Section 232 tariffs, which we strongly believe uh, to be unlawful, um, to be against interests on both sides of the Atlantic, against interests of uh, um, steel, against interests of consumers. So, uh, if those were to be lifted, uh, then uh, they would be uh, they would die away. Uh, in terms of where the UK is, uh, in contrast to going back for a moment to Airbus Boeing, where the UK made the first move in de-escalating uh, the Airbus Boeing suite, which is fundamentally uh, uh, quite different because that's going on actual WTO awards. Uh, there's no question, I think, about the legality uh, of those tariffs. There's definitely a question around uh, the desirability of them. Uh, but the UK made the first move in not rolling over um, the, um, the uh, Boeing retaliatory tariffs. So I think your question is not entirely unreasonable. Well, if you rolled over, and the difference is we see the, the two things being fundamentally different. Section 232 uh, we see as having been unlawful. Uh, we are doing, we did roll over the EU tariffs. We will be doing our own consultation shortly on uh, what the UK mix uh, will look like. So we want to have uh, a mix which uh, particularly suits uh, the UK. And I'd urge you to respond, as I'm sure you will be uh, responding to that consultation. On carbon border adjustment, look, the UK, I mean, we're in- Can you, can you keep it pretty br brief? Greg? Yeah, I'm just, I will be very brief, out. Simon. Um, just to say, look, uh, I, I, we're watching the debate closely. Uh, um, I don't think it's entirely straightforward, uh, carbon border adjustments. Um, and we would be keen to see a little bit more on how exactly it would work uh, and uh, um, uh, and uh, before uh, coming to a more definitive UK view on carbon border adjustment. Thank you very much, Greg, thanks. Um, Bernd and Marjorie, I'm going to have, try and have to hold you to a minute each, so uh, if you could pick up uh, any final comments uh, that you want to make related to the questions or more broadly. Bernd? Yeah, on the steel tariffs, yes, at the moment, uh, two trains on the same track, that's a problem, we have to negotiate. Otherwise, we will double the uh, um, tariff because it's, as uh, Greg said, illegal uh, and not aligned with WTO rules. Um, on CBAM, yeah, we need to have uh, answers on four questions. First, is this WTO compatible? Second, what are the remaining trading partners saying? US, China, India. Uh, thirdly, is it really fits in in the domestic system? And fourthly, is it really efficient? And then we can introduce it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bernd. Marjorie? Yeah, sorry, very quickly for me. On 232, um, as I said at the outset, we have opposed these tariffs and we continue to oppose them. Uh, the question was, are we pushing the administration on that? The answer is yes. Um, there is obviously a domestic political imperative here that changes the, the, uh, uh, the calculus a little bit. Um, and so, as I said at the outset, I think it's going to take a little longer to resolve, but I'd like to think um, that we will see uh, a move in the right direction. In terms of the CBAM, um, again, new administration, new Congress, 
uh, and um, a, a very robust discussion going on here. Um, question about carbon pricing here. Our view on the prospect of, of the European CBAM is, um, is that, you know, understand the impulse, but the key will be if, it, if there is one to make sure that it is um, uh, not discriminatory and is WTO compliant. Great. Well, look, thank you very much. I mean, thank you everybody for joining. I mean, we could have gone on for two or three hours, I think. Um, uh, so we've whetted our appetite, but there's a huge amount still to discuss. And it's really fascinating. Lots of opportunities, lots of new challenges. I want to thank our three uh, presenters and panelists very much for your great contributions from your different perspectives. It's been a good discussion. Thanks to those who asked questions and thanks to those who organized the event. And I suspect we're going to be meeting again to discuss these issues uh, not in the not too distant future. Many thanks to everybody. Cheers. Goodbye. Bye.